people between Facebook and online room assignments and all of these organizations. So what I think religious organizations need to be offering or what they can offer that other organizations may not be um, mandated in their bylaws or mission statement um, is that they can add meaning to people's lives and that they can provide a context in which individuals make decisions and can help deepen relationships with peers. So this sort of goes back to the bigger, I want to take a step back, right? This is um, what's the future of faith in America? So the question I want to ask then is why is it even important for religious organizations to exist? Like why does it matter if there's faith in America in the future? Um, one of the struggles that I've seen in the Jewish community is that the answer to this question is so often that, so that Judaism will continue. But something continuing just for its own sake or existing just for the sake that it will exist is really not enough. Um, as students here, I think you know that better than most people, right? For example, I, I don't think that Fiance Marathon happens every year just so students can say that we posted DM for X number of years. DM happens because students feel passionately about it, um, about the cause, about coming together as a community, and because of the difference in the lives of so many people that it makes. And similarly, we need a better answer to why religious groups need to exist than just to say that we can, uh, that there are a certain number of faithful or observant followers. I don't believe that one religion holds a monopoly on truth. And I don't believe that just because Judaism might bring something to the world means that other religions aren't contributing real meaning to the world, perhaps even in the exact same ideal. What I do believe is that different religions are going to resonate with different people and so having multiple choices means that more people are going to have inspired, are going to be inspired to live a life of meaning and action. I might say that I think Judaism, I would like to see Judaism continue into the future so that people are not only inspired but commanded to treat the orphan, the widow, and the stranger. In other words, the oppressed and the often forgotten about in society. Um, because it, it talks about this over 65 times in the Torah. Um, that people are commanded to give to charity, not just that it's a nice thing to do, or that people are commanded not only to strive um, to be holy because they were created in God's image and God is holy. I might say that Judaism needs to continue so that people are inspired to be in relationship with one another using the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber's I-Thou approach. This approach values the other person fully for who they are as an individual. It is often described as an encounter where we participate in, uh, in something with the other and both the I and the thou are transformed by the relationship between them. The you we encounter is encountered in its entirety, not as a sum of its qualities. And this phenomena of encounter might best be described as love. Contrary to this is the experience of an I-it relationship where things are viewed based on their utility, um, a thing to be known or put to some purpose. In experience, we see our object as a collection of qualities and quantities. Most relationships, unfortunately, are I, it, in nature. Um, but I think it's beautiful that Judaism really brings this, um, this concept to the world to guide us in our most intimate of relationships. I might say that Judaism needs to continue so that people have a way of marking time in a meaningful way. Too often, seasons move from one to the next, all sort of flowing together. But, uh, and rituals may seem archaic to some, but I really see them as a way of demarking holy time from mundane. And without mundane, we can't fully appreciate the holy. There are so many things that bring um, the Judaism, there are many things that Judaism brings to the world, a love of learning and questioning, a sense of caring about one's neighbors, and a commandment to repair the world, a long tradition of standing up when there is injustice. And regardless of whether one identifies with Judaism as a religion or as a culture, the important thing for the future of Judaism is that Jews identify with its teachings and know that the values that they hold are rooted in tradition. The important thing for America on the question of the future of faith is that people believe in something, a God, a higher power, the, the future of humanity. For if we don't believe in something, we are bound to fall into despair. May we continue to come together to learn from one another as a way of expanding communities of faith. May we continue to ask what the role of religion is so that we do not become complacent in our practice, doing things only because that's what's been done before. And may our conversations and questions bring us closer together as individuals, helping us to bring a vision of peace and understanding to the world. Amen.
Thank you again, Rabbi Suedro. Next, I'd like to introduce pa Pastor Mike Patz from the Greenhouse Church. Uh, <laughs> Shalom, Salam, Howdy, how are you? If you uh, don't know me, my name is Mike Patz. I am uh, very, very pleased, very honored to be here. Really enjoyed our guests. Uh, I'm the husband of a precious wife named Ruth, have eight children, all right, very fruitful. So often people ask me, are you Muslim? Are you starting a Jewish tribe or something like that? So it's kind of a nice little crowd tonight. I've got one son, his name is Isaiah, and he really kind of likes to be like his dad. I and mean, he hit the point with eight children, you can imagine we are very motivated to get our children potty trained at a pretty good age. Uh, he hit a point where, I mean, we gotta get this stuff going, otherwise you have to take out a mortgage for diapers. And so, uh, I've tried to teach him in potty training, it was not going very well. And finally I said, okay, son, this is what we're gonna do. You know, you know what manly boys do? You follow me. You walked outside, went out to a tree, and I, I know this is crude, I know we're in a church. I said, manly boys pee on trees. I thought it was the end of the story. He said this was good. I thought it was going to be really nice. I come home the next day. Inside our house, there used to be an artificial tree. I come home. My wife looks at me, and she gives me the look like you're in serious trouble. And she says, Michael, can you explain this? And I look at my son, and you smell it. It's odiferous. I mean, it's, it's strong. I said, son, what's going on? He looks back. He says, manly boys. Yeah, <laughs> you know, when I think about the issue that we're dealing with right now, I'm, I'm not just using that as sort of a, an opening joke, I use that very seriously. When I think about the problem of faith in America or morality in America, that was sort of the issue that was thrown on the table. I don't know how to answer from a Jewish perspective, I don't know how to answer from a Muslim perspective. But I can answer from a Christian perspective, because to be honest with you, if there's problems in America, the majority of Americans would claim to be Christians, which means that they would claim to follow Jesus Christ. And that, therein lies the problem that I would have. So I can't so much critique religion in general. I have to almost bring an internal critique. So what I'm going to say is would be sort of addressed to Christians. And I would love for any of you that are Jewish or Muslim to kind of think in. Because the primary problem Christians have is we're supposed to be those who follow Jesus. My, what, what's a shame is when my son follows my lead better than so-called Jesus followers follow his lead. Does that make sense? So when I think about the issues that are on the table before us, the challenges that, that face the religious landscape that we've got, when I look at that, I think about the way that people struggle uh, relating to each other, for example. If you are here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you follow Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the prophet, Jesus, the teacher, Jesus, the Savior, if you follow Jesus, you're supposed to look something like Jesus, to act something like Jesus. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy are supposed to kiss and come together. Somehow, the, the meaning of scriptures, and in fact, in, the, in the, the scriptures that I read, it basically says, you know what someone really believes, that's their faith, based on how they actually act. You know someone's true, what's going on in the inside of their heart, based on what they do. Now, when I think about where we are, and I look at Christians in general, I think to myself, you know, all these Christians that claim to follow him, and I'll be honest, sometimes, a lot of the problem, a lot of Christianity is it's hypocrisy. There's a lot of problem with that. But sometimes, I feel like, i got to almost tell people, like, I don't know if any of you surf. Um, I, I remember last summer, I was out on the beach, and so when I came back, and someone said, what were you doing at the beach? I said, I was surfing. And they said, oh, really? You know, how big is your board? I'm like, well, it's a boogie board. They said, oh, you're not a surfer, you're a poser. I was like, I was like, no, no I, I'm like, just because I'm boogie boarding, that doesn't mean I'm not surfing. I'm like, no, 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 that's not surfing. Now, if we have any surfers in here, but if you're a surfer, you know boogie boarding is not the same as surfing. There's a lot of people that are claiming to follow Jesus, and here's the bottom line: they're not. They're not. When I hear about things like, I mean, I, when I when I look back on history and I see things like the Crusades, I think to myself, I, I just want to apologize to anybody that looks back on that and somehow attaches the name of Jesus to the Crusades. I assure you. Anything done, it's, it, it, many, many things that have been done in the so-called name of Jesus, in that, of that ilk, that is not the name of Jesus whatsoever. And I look at that and I think, well, that's poser Christianity. That's posing as a follower of Jesus, but that's not making you, I hate to be crass, that's not making your way out to the tree and finding the same thing that your Father in Heaven is doing. See, the problem I see with the future of American faith, especially as it relates to Christianity, as it relates to the religious landscape, it's... It's a dead Christianity, because at the center of the Christian story, at the center of the Jesus story, 
It's, it's a fun, the, the difference of the Christian approach or the Jesus approach, it's different at the fundamental level. Because if I ask the other panelists that are up here, and if we ask most religions in general, we said, how would you describe your religion? They're going to say what their moral code is. They're going to say, this is what you should do. And the fact of the matter is, whether we're dealing with Islam, Judaism, or Christianity, our ethics are awfully similar. If I said right now, let's take a vote, who thinks murder is wrong? Everyone's going to say that. So in America, when you say something like, we need to get more moral, everybody agrees with that. We agree with that as long as we're saying something like, don't murder, or we say, tell kids, don't smoke crack. But as soon as you start mentioning morals that might get in your face, now morality is not such a cut and dry thing. So for example, um, if we were to say something like, who's against slavery? Everyone in here would say, I'm against slavery. In fact, this is the generation now, of, like everyone's a man, let's, let's end it, let's stop human trafficking, let's stop sex slavery. Everyone's against that, watch, unless you have to do something about it. What do you mean? Okay, here's an here's a for example. Um, probably 50% of the chocolate that we eat comes from cocoa beans made in the Ivory Coast. Probably a very good proportion, almost half of the uh, people that are harvesting the chocolate, the cocoa beans in the Ivory Coast are children kidnapped in one country, brought to another country. So if you say to somebody, hey, let's be against human trafficking, everybody likes buying a t-shirt that says, hey, join me in kind of being, you know, kind of check, I'm against human trafficking. But if you said something like, for example, a lot of people in our faith community have said, you know what, we don't buy chocolate unless we know for a fact it's slave free. So when I hear people say things like, I'm against slavery, my, my next question usually is, so what would you, where would your faith or where would your religion or where would your commitment to a God or a divinity, where would that ever actually intersect with real life. And, that's, and this is the catch. At the center of the Jesus story is a story about a God who became one of us. It's a story about a God who came in flesh, who came and he said to us, God has come to you and I'm going to do what you cannot do yourself. The Jesus message is that we connect to God not based on our moral record, but based on the moral record of Jesus. And because of that, we get what we would call peace or shalom or salam. We would find peace with God. We find in one of the prophets, Jeremiah, chapter 31, he said, uh, God said basically, I'm going to make a covenant with my people. I will write my laws in their hearts. He said, there's going to come a day when I'm going to write my laws in their hearts and in their minds. Now, this is the, this is the, at the, this is the root level difference where, this, again, this is not just between Christianity and other religions. Most of the Christians I meet do not believe what I'm about to say, which is that the righteousness that God accepts is not based on something that we could do ourselves, but rather it's a change that starts on the inside and then makes its way to the outside. So there's a moral code that all of us know. In fact, we would agree on with it. But the problem is this. Whether you're in America or Saudi Arabia or Finland, all over the planet, humans have shown the incapacity to be able to keep the moral code. So while Jews and Gentiles and, and Muslims and non-Muslims would all agree on certain laws like don't buy, whether you're in a playground or whether you're a CEO of a company, all over the world people lie. The question is, what do you do about the problem of the immorality and the spiritual foolishness and folly. If you, what do you do about that? And this is where the message of Jesus is not just a moral dictate, but it's a moral message of something that's been done. Parables told of, of a king that went out to war. There was a nation that was in danger. And, and while they were about to be uh, taken captive, the king went out to battle for them. And he went out and they didn't know what was going to happen. And at the end of the battle, finally the king won. And he, sent, he went and got messengers. He said, send the messengers back and tell them, good news, the king has won. And when he got back, they said, good news, you can be at peace, the king has won. And here was the catch. He said, I want you to now be good to one another, be righteous with one another, because you've got victory. But there'd be a fundamental difference if the king had lost. Because if the king had lost, he would not have sent them back with good news, he would have sent them back with good advice. And the good advice would have been, fight for your lives, run for your lives, duck, hide, and cover yourselves. The message of Jesus is a message that the righteousness that God requires is not a righteousness that can be worked with human hands. Although humans can live upright and righteous lives, the message of Jesus is that God himself looked at us, loved us, cared for us, and cherished us, came and he lived the life we should have lived, and then he died the death we should have died. The message of Jesus is that I was so bad that he had to die, but I was so loved that he was glad to die. And that whoever gets that in here 
Whoever gets that reality going on in here, he writes his laws on their hearts. And now they don't just obey because they have to. They obey because something has happened on the inside. Let me end it like this. I believe we are wired to connect with God. And when we are connected to God, we have shalom. When we're connected to God, we have peace. We are wired for God to be our ultimate. And according to the, the Jesus message, our problem is not just that we sin. Our problem is that we have lived lives where God is not our ultimate thing. But if God would ever become our ultimate, if God would ever become our first love, the scriptures tell us that we would find shalom. I've got a son. Last story I'll tell you. His name is Malachi. And he's got asthma. And one day his, his favorite baseball team is the New York Yankees. I don't know if you like the Yankees or not. Oh, no. This could be a problem. Okay, I know you're from Brooklyn, but... My son, he, he said, Daddy, can we go to a Yankee game? I said, let's do it. So we went down to Tropicana Field in Tampa, go to this place to see a Yankee game. While we're on our way down there, I forget our tickets that I got on StubHub. While we're on our way down there, he starts having an asthma attack and we stopped at a hotel. While we're there, we end up showing up late to the game. We go to the game. All I want in life is for the New York Yankees to win. The New York Yankees lose. The devil was winning at that moment, right? I come back, I lay down, I'm putting my head down on a pillow. It's been one of the worst days you can imagine. I put my head down and my son looks at me and says, Daddy, Today was my best day. I said, son, how was today your best day? You had an asthma attack. We had no asthma medicine for you. The Yankees lost. The room we are in smells like smoke. He said, because daddy, I'm with you. And the message of Jesus is that if you could ever get reconciled to God, if he ever became your real thing, that's where you'd find shalom. Thank you. Mike. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Harun Mogul, a PhD candidate from Columbia University. I am allergic to ice cream. <laughs> Breaks my heart. I'm good. I'm okay. Uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you for everyone who put this together. Uh, thank you to American Airlines for getting me reasonably on time. <laughs> With the name of God, the one, the unique, we praise him and aspire to be in awe of him as his awesomeness demands. We ask prayers and peace upon our teachers, Abraham, the friend of God, Moses, who spoke to God, Jesus, the Messiah, John, the Baptist, and Muhammad, mercy to the worlds. And upon all those who follow in righteousness, then, now, and until the end of time, I was asked to speak about the future of faith, and what I would like to talk about is a perspective as a Muslim that I think needs to be described. A hole I see in our practice and reality of Islam, and that is the absence of the ability and the space to be fully and completely human. We have imposed on ourselves many times in our communities standards and expectations that are almost impossible to live up to. A religion that asks nothing of you is ultimately useless because it does not push you to become better. But a religion that asks you to go too far will ultimately crush you because it does not give you the room to grow organically, naturally, and in a healthy and normal way. We have forgotten the role of love in Islam. And if we think about who the most popular poet is in America year after year after year, year after year after year, it's Rumi. Right? who's a poet from Afghanistan who ends up in what is now Turkey. He's a Muslim, he's a classical scholar of Islamic law, of Sharia. And he's a poet of love. And there is no contradiction between these things, and this is what I would like to see through three stories in the Muslim tradition, which speak first of the love of a mother for her child, the love of a wife for her husband, and the love of one man for another as brothers and community, of friendship, a bond that is unbreakable in life and then in death. The first of these concerns Jesus and Mary, and God's peace and blessings be upon them both. We know in the Muslim tradition in the 19th chapter that when Mary is pregnant with Jesus, her community turns her out. They accuse her of unrighteousness and infidelity, and she is driven to a place where she must give birth to Jesus alone. And she says in the Quran, I wish I was a thing forgotten, and I forgot myself. Nesyam mansiya. The depth of this statement, the grief, the pain that it explains and describes is something we don't remember, we don't talk about. That she is in such pain, physically, emotionally, spiritually, 
that she says, I wish I was dead to the world and to myself. And yet in many mosques, if you express pain, spiritual heartache, mental illness, there is no room for these things. Yet there it is in the Quran. The second of these stories concerns the love of a wife for a husband and a husband for a wife. When Muhammad is 40 years old and he's meditating in the mountains outside of Mecca, the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, recite. And Muhammad says, I do not know what to recite, or according to other translations, I cannot recite. And the angel squeezes him and asks a second time, and then a third time. And upon the third, the angel recites the first five verses that Muslims believe are the beginning of the Quran, ordering him to read in the name of his Lord, who created man, man from a clot of blood, who taught man by the pen what he knew not. And Muhammad is so traumatized and terrified that he comes up to the mountain, and according to some recollections, he contemplates throwing himself off. And yet everywhere he looks, he sees filling the sky this massive creature that says over and over again, I am Gabriel, sent from God, and you, Muhammad, are a messenger of God. And Muhammad is so terrified that he runs home, back to Mecca, arrives in his house, and he is shaking. And his wife says, what happened? And he says, I think I'm going mad. And he describes the moment to her. And then she says, do you see him right now of Gabriel? And he says, yes. She herself cannot see him. So she inches closer to him till their legs are touching. And she says, do you see him now? And he says, yes. And then she sits on his lap. She removes her cloak and places it around them so their skin is touching, body to body. And she says, do you see him now? And he says, no. And she smiles and says, then he is an angel sent from God and not a demon. And he says, why do you say this? Because, she says, he has modesty in the presence of a husband and a wife, and therefore he is of godly nature. She believes in him, even against her own eyes, because the true mark of love is that we believe in others. We think better of them, we think higher of them. We put them first ahead of ourselves. The first Muslim is a woman, Khadija, 15 years older than her husband. That is love. When Muhammad preaches the message, it is a challenge like all messages because it forces you to confront your immediate tactile sensory world. For a man to say, I bring a message from God, challenges our sensory experience of the world. And yet we see with all the prophets and all the great teachers that people come to believe because they believe and see and experience exactly as was said, the goodness of these people that is undeniable. There is simply no way anyone can imagine that Moses, Jesus, or Muhammad are lying because of the nature of their character, their uprightness. This is love. And the final of these is one that is very close to me personally, because it speaks to what kind of communities we must build and we need to build. When Muhammad is in Medina, there is a man there named Julebid. Julebid literally in Arabic means stunted or misshapen. Now hopefully that's not his actual name. But what it means is we don't know his name. There's also no Ibn or Bin after his name, meaning he has no lineage. Which means in a tribal society where who your father was was everything, he completely does not belong. He is on the margins. He doesn't matter. And when Muhammad arrives in Medina, he takes Julebib under his wing. He goes so far as to seek out a spouse for him, a wife for him. He finds a woman who goes against the wishes of her parents because they say, who would marry a man like that? He doesn't have any lineage. Look at how he looks. He's, not a, good, he's, he's a horrible match. I mean, he, it's fine if he's Muslim, we can pray next to him, but to let him into our lives, to make him part of our family, no. But she goes against the wishes of her parents and marries him, and the marriage is happy, but it is brief. One day when Muhammad is out, they are attacked. Tribal society, desert society, it's a harsh society. People often attack one another looking for 
their animals, their food, their water, so on and so forth. And when the battle is over, Muhammad gathers his companions and says, who have you lost? And everyone names someone. And Muhammad asks again, who have you lost? And they name the same names and they look at each other kind of awkwardly. And Muhammad says a third time, who have you lost? And at this point, I imagine they're looking down at their feet, wishing some sort of distraction would emerge because they understand that he is upset, but they don't know why. And he says, I have lost Julebu. This is also love. That in a situation of crisis, when your life is in danger, who do you think of? And Muhammad is thinking of the person that no one else is thinking of, which is why we as Muslims believe he is Muhammad. And when they find Julebib, he is dead. And Muhammad says, and this I never forget, I will bury him. And he buries him with his own hands. And then he says, he is of me, and I am of him. And he gave him, at the end of his life, a lineage far greater than any he could have had. Because he says, if I am the prophet of God, if I am the mercy to the world, then he and I, we are together. Not just in this life, but in the next. What we need in our communities is a willingness to be human, an acceptance of our faults and flaws, a desire to work and build together, to build bridges across religions between those of different faith or of no particular faith, whether secular or sacred, however we look at it, because we are all human and we have this obligation to each other. This can only be done through love. It can only be done by the belief that we are all his children. And therefore, none of us has any right over any other. Thank you very much. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. Thank you so much, Harun Mogul, and all of our speakers. Uh, right now, we're going to take a short break to prep for the Q&A session. If you have any more questions you'd like to text in, feel free to do that. Or if you'd also like to take a bathroom break, go ahead and feel free to do that. It'll be about five minutes. question of tonight's, we'll start with, how do your faith describe fundamental human nature? Do you believe a person can be a good and moral person without adhering to a religious background? And we'll start it off with Rabbi Swedro. <coughs> Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I was getting hand signals from the audience over there. Anyways, um, so Judaism, Judaism's view is that People are created with Salam Elohim in God's image, which means that people are inherently good in their nature. Um, and that in terms of whether or not a person needs to have a religious background in order to be considered good or moral, it's, that's not really part of the equation. Um, there's the idea of orthodoxy in Judaism, but it's, it's sort of a misnomer, the idea of correct belief. Really, Judaism focuses more on orthopraxy or correct practice, and so it's about how we live our lives and if we're treating one another um, the way we think that God would want us to be treating people. That's what matters at the end of the day. For a Christian, uh, what we would say is that, in agreement with that, that humans were made in God's image, uh, but in Genesis, Scripture says that basically Adam and Eve kind of pulled a substitution. God had said, I will call the shots, and they substituted themselves for God uh, and sinned. And when they sinned, it was really a, a rejection of God himself. And so while we were made in God's image, we are, that image has really been marred in a way. So the, the, the Jesus perspective would be that we, have, we are fallen, that we are creatures that are fallen, and, uh, and that we need help. We need, some, we need outside help. We need outside intervention in the same way that someone that's drowning would need to be rescued. And, uh, and our take would be, do we believe a person can be good moral without adhering to religious background?
that's a question that we really wouldn't ask as far as just being religious. Our, in fact, all three of us, would, our, our faith father in many ways would be Abraham. And the scriptures say that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so for us, uh, that is what happens. That just like when God made the work started, God said, Abraham, I'm going you know, to make your descendants more than the stars of the sky. And he believed him. And that's where, when he believed that interactive relationship with God, with God was possible, that's where that changed. And I believe God he changed something in him. And the same thing with us. So now with Jesus, when someone puts their faith in the finished work of what Jesus has done, they get made righteous and changed. Um, I think uh, in the Muslim tradition, uh, similarly, you know, God has 99 names, which not only describe Him, but are Him. And, and uh, you know, one of the traditions says uh, humanity was created ala surat rahman uh, in, in the image of the most merciful, the divine. Uh, so, you know, the same. Uh, the Muslim belief is that when God creates Adam, uh, He says to the angels assembled that I will create a caliph on earth. A uh, caliph in Arabic is sort of like power of attorney, someone who you delegate to represent you in a sense. Uh, Adam and Eve are placed in the garden, uh, they are tempted by Satan, they eat from the tree, uh, they are punished, as in they are sent down, they ask for forgiveness and they are forgiven, but God places them on earth. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that in Muslim tradition, uh, God says, I will create a caliph on earth, and then starts Adam and Eve off in the garden. So the Muslim tradition, the fundamental tension and, and, and beauty of human existence is that one, we sin, and two, we repent and we are forgiven. Uh, so this relationship is at the core of Islam. So it's that we will always stray, we will always err, right? And it is not for material reasons, right? Adam and Eve want for nothing, right? But it's curiosity, kill the cat, and create the caliphate. Um, so and that, that was a really bad joke. Um, I can do more if you'd like. Um, but uh, also, I don't eat ice cream. Um, and a friend of mine is calling me right now, which would be awesome if I took the call. Um, you want to get it? It's kind of weird. It, I, I don't know what's happening right now. Oh my god, this is happening. <laughs> don't, don't say anything. You want him to call you back? Okay, I'll try to call him. I mean, he. <laughs> Them. <laughs> next question. Okay. So our next question is going to be: What is the biggest threat to the future of your faith? <laughs> the iPhone. <laughs> I mean, my faith personally, or no? Um, you know, I, I think that. Um, this is going to be the worst segue ever. Um, <laughs> probably the worst. Um, to be honest, I think, you know, there, there's different reasons that people lose faith. And, and one of those is, is from uh, looking at what people do in the name of faith, right? So, um, really, in the Muslim tradition, right, you know, you have Jesus and his, his disciples, the apostles, right, who are also mentioned in the Quran. And, and you have Muhammad and his companions, you have Moses and the children of Israel, and central in this relationship is this relationship of companionship, of, of brotherhood, of sisterhood, of fellowship. And what it, what it means is that there are different epistemologies, or different types of truth, and the truth of faith is, you know, exactly as, as you were saying, is, is embodied in action, right? So people look at someone in the name of Islam, uh, saying and doing things that are fundamentally contrary to Islam, uh, that usually alienates people from Islam. And the challenge I see is you have people in, in the Muslim world who are externally very visibly Muslim, you know, in, in that they embody certain characteristics, but Islam is not in them. And there's a saying of the Prophet to the effect that a time will come when you will see people uh, who will be sort of the most pious of those among you, as if they will embody Islam, but they will be the worst of people. Uh, that nothing of faith will go beyond their mouths, right? That there is no actual faith in them, it is simply the illusion of faith or the image of faith. And I think that is for Muslims the, the biggest threat, because that's what chases you out of faith, that's what destroys faith, right? It's people who say that they're Muslim and then they do things, and, and we all, I think, have seen the consequences of those things. So for someone that follows Jesus, the biggest danger that I see pop up all the time is a uh, reliance or a commitment to a moralism 
uh, and, a, and a legalism, if you will, and thinking that somehow that a moral approach is going to maybe bring them a salvation or some kind of a connection with God. And while we would say that good morals and good laws may restrain the heart, they do not change the heart. And it, is, it has been our experience, and it's the, it's the teaching of Jesus, that unless that new covenant happens where someone looks, it was almost like this in, uh, in the Tanakh, in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, there was a point where a lot of the Israelites were all uh, getting sick. They were getting bit by snakes, and they were dying. And Moses went and he lifted up the rod in the wilderness. And when he did that, there was this brazen serpent up on it. And whoever looked to the brazen serpent was saved, and they would get rescued and healed. And Jesus applied that when he said, in the same way, whoever believes in me, whoever looks to me, is going to be rescued. And the idea was, there's a rescue that happens that came not from you. So the danger I see is when there are people that have this excessive looking into or down upon their moralism, as opposed to up to the brazen serpent, if you want to say it like that. So we're looking at their own righteousness as opposed to the righteousness of God. And when that happens, they get changed and then they start back. So that's the big danger I see. One, two of the biggest what was the term? threats to the future of Judaism, as I see it, is they're almost contradictory. On the one hand, I see apathy as being a real threat. People who don't necessarily care what the tradition says, people who don't think it's worth taking the time to get involved, to make the world a better place, to learn about what the tradition has to say. And on the other hand, um, people who feel that the tradition, there's this idea uh, that the, the, the Torah is loba shemaini, that it's not in the heavens, that it's here on earth for us to really be able to grapple with. Um, and so the people who think that the tradition is so far removed from us and that it has nothing to say about the world around us, um, and there's no way we can learn anything about it rather than taking the time to reinterpret texts, how to find meaning in them, um, and how to really open their eyes to the fact that there's lots of really exciting, creative things happening in the Jewish community, but to think that A, it, they don't care, or B, none of it applies to them, even if it were. Okay, so next up, the question is, what does your faith say about loving those who don't believe in the same things that you do? All right, I'll take a stab at that. Since the, at the center of the story of Jesus, at, at the center of, of our whole faith, is that God came, suffered, went to an execution stake, and he gave himself for people that were rejecting him. He, he was excluded so we could be included. He was rejected so we could be accepted. So if somebody follows Jesus, and at the center of our story is a suffering servant, you cannot follow Jesus and then simultaneously look down on someone else. In fact, one way of looking at it is you, you cannot simultaneously look down on someone else and be looking up to God at the same time. And so what we would say is, if you follow Jesus, you have, by definition, you, you could not feel superior or look down on someone of another faith or a person of no faith. To follow Jesus means you would be uh, having a very generous heart because you serve a God who has a generous heart. So there's an old joke that says, two Jews, three opinions. <laughs> so when I saw this, it, it's interesting because I think if Jews didn't love people who didn't believe the same thing that they themselves believed, then we would all hate everybody in our own community, let alone people who are in, in other faith communities. Um, one of my favorite teachings in the Talmud, the collection of the oral law that's been written down, um, which is a little weird, but that's okay, um, the oral law and all of its commentaries is teku which means let them stand. And, and it's used when there are multiple opinions contradicting or um, disagreeing on a particular point. And sometimes the, the redactor, the editor of the Talmud will come in and say, let it stand. We're not going to tell you which opinion's right. We're not going to tell you which one we follow. We're just letting them both sort of be. And what that really says to me is that we should allow room for there to be multiple opinions in our communities. And that there is truth on some level um, in, in more than one form, and so if that is to be true, then, and we're able to create room for those opinions, and we should certainly be loving the people who are expressing them. So I think uh, on the topic, obviously, uh, you know, I, I'm a 
a firm believer that when you discuss a religion, and specifically Islam, which is what I study, uh, there is a difference between the opinion you hold and expressing the reality of the, the, the concept, the sort of the circumstance of the faith, right? And I, I don't think it's, uh, it's honest intellectually and, and, and spiritually to misrepresent that history. So in the Islamic tradition, you know, Muhammad is, is born in a circumstance where there really is nothing but this very hierarchical and violent tribal system. And what he does in his life is he struggles to find first a refuge for his followers when they're persecuted. And this means sending them to Abyssinia. And he specifically says to them, there in Abyssinia there is a Christian king under whom you will find justice. You will be treated fairly. And he's correct. And the first Muslim community, and the longest continuously existing Muslim community, is actually founded in Ethiopia, uh, where one of the prophet's daughters is buried. Um, in, and that's in northern Ethiopia near the Red Sea. Uh, when this is, however, not enough, he moves north. He has the, the, the sort of the Muslim exodus about 250 miles north to a city that is now called Medina, which is Arabic for city. Uh, we are the religion of obviousness sometimes. Um, <laughs> it's okay, it's kind of cool. Um, it makes you know, fewer things to remember. And uh, there he dictates one of the first constitutions in human history, and, and the constitution says that, that the Jews and the Muslims uh, of Medina, because there were many Arab tribes that were ethnically Arab, Jewish in religion, uh, are, are one ummah, they are one nation. And, and what I tell people is that if you look at Muhammad's life as a, as, a, as a general journey, it is about replacing a tribal system based on bloodline with a system based on justice. And it is about creating a community that transcends individualized and, and mutually suspicious and hostile communities, right? The idea of a, I almost call it like a super tribe, right? A tribe beyond all the tribes. And so I think in Islam, there is a strong emphasis, or should be a strong emphasis, on promoting human unity, right? And there is a very famous saying of Ali, the Prophet's uh, uh, cousin and son-in-law, that you should respect all others, for they're either your brothers or faith, or they're your brothers because you are all descended from Adam. Thank you. So the next question is, how is homosexuality addressed within your faith backgrounds? <laughs> That's okay. You know, I brag. Um, so again, within Judaism, there are multiple opinions on, on any particular issue. So I'm going to try to express multiple opinions because I think sort of along the lines of what everyone was saying, it would be intellectually dishonest to say otherwise. So Leviticus talks about um, one who lies with another man is an abomination. One, yeah, okay. A man who lies with another man is an abomination. Um, and so there are people within Judaism who interpret that verse literally and consider the act of homosexuality to be um, a sin. However, it should be pointed out that the, the word for an abomination in Hebrew toeva is used to describe all sorts of other acts um, that people are doing all the time. And so it's not considered to be um, a good thing, but it's certainly not considered to be worse than a whole bunch of other things that I would say most people in this room are doing. Um, I'll spare you the details. Uh, that being said, Judy, you need to be There's a long tradition of, of interpreting texts, um, both in their historical context and also from grammatical points of view. And so I've heard interpretations where the word um, as one lies with another man could be interpreted, could be reread as when. Right? The, the beauty, to some extent, I think, within Judaism is that we're working with a text that's not in English, which means there's different nuances. So one who lies with a man, when one lies, one who lies with a man, when one lies with a woman. I, I don't even like pay attention so much to the specifics of the verse. This is my own, um, perhaps my, my own leanings. Um, but it's, one could read it as that saying that um, three ways are what's an abomination. There's also the idea that in the historical context, at that time, no one could imagine a consensual relationship between two men because homosexuality was seen as a power dynamic. Um, and so the idea of a consensual, mutually loving relationship between two people of the same sex was unheard of. Today, in the world that we live in, that's definitely not the case. There are consensual, loving relationships between two people. 
people of the same sex. And so in that case, it would be not being read the way that it was originally written in the Torah. So, um, and all of those opinions between the act itself is not okay to it's fine um, are all encompassed within Judaism. <laughs> <laughs> Producer. Uh, so, within the Muslim tradition, uh, the first mention of homosexuality chronologically, as described in the Quran, uh, is uh, the encounter of the Prophet Lot, peace be upon him, Abraham's nephew, uh, with the people of what are called the fallen cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it would be very hard to argue that the Islamic tradition holds an opinion other than homosexuality uh, as a behavior, as in homosexual actions. Are, are, are sins, right? So that's, that's pretty conclusive in the Islamic tradition. Uh, I have not seen an argument that has been able to sort of get out of that. Um, whatever you make of that is your own business, but that's basically textually where the tradition stands. Um, at the same time, I think what is, is, you know, me personally, for example, I feel as an American, um, I, you know, I have religious opinions, for example, on what types of marriage are permissible and not. But I don't believe it's any business of the state. That's me personally. I believe the Constitution implies a secular society. That's how I look at it. Um, I also want to note that there are different conceptions of sexuality uh, in the world, and that some of these challenge our conceptions of what is normative and sexual. So, for example, those of you who are Punjabi in the audience, prepare to be embarrassed, um, or necessarily push, it's something that's permissible. Uh, and secondly, of course, you have issues like polygamy, right? So early Islam features certain allowances for polygamy from a society where it was rampant and so it was restricted, it was pulled back. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is because I think our conception of sexuality very much evolves from uh, a conception that, you know, there's heterosexuality and there's homosexuality. And I don't think that distinction existed in quite the same way in Islamic society. So as an example of this, um, Muslim scholars tended to view female homosexuality as less of a sin than male homosexuality because of the argument some made that it emerges out of emotion and not out of lust. Um, so there were different kinds of arguments around these things. Uh, the tradition is much more comfortable discussing human sexuality than I think many Muslim communities are today. Uh, and many, much more open, I think, to the reality of the different expressions of human sexuality. Wow, thank you. Uh, so what, I think that first of all, on the question, the, we have a challenge because culturally things have, are polarized and it's, we're kind of at a point culturally where if you disagree with somebody, that's seen as being hateful. So uh, right now at the, in the cultural dialogue that we live in, it's not enough to disagree with someone, we, we tend to demonize people. So if you hear someone that disagrees with you, I, I personally think it's a very unfortunate state of affairs when someone feels like they, they're hateful just because they're different than you. So, that's why if there's a political election, George W. Bush, he wasn't just bad, he was evil or, you know, or wicked. Or if someone's conservative, um, Barack Obama is not just a bad president, he's a wicked man. And so, and so I, I think for us, if you follow Jesus, you avoid that. From a Christian perspective, the scriptures, yeah, the scriptures are like the Muslim scriptures where they would say, they would affirm that homosexuality would be sinful. Um, we would also say it would be sinful to demonize people that are homosexuals, all right? So just say it like that. Um, but the Bible would also say there's many other things that are, that are abominable are sinful. So, but that wouldn't make them any, any less wrong. The danger we see with the homosexual community in particular would be that the homosexual issue has become people's identity. So rather than just being a sin, people have come to identify themselves in a way like that. And if someone belongs to Jesus and follows him, they would say that their primary identity is a child of God. And the reason that matters is we tend to act out of our perceived identity. So when someone says, I perceive myself to be this or that, I just think it's dangerous. And, and what most of the people I've talked to that are struggling um, or, or accepting of their homosexuality, they say, Mike, I just feel like I was born this way or I didn't ask for this or I didn't choose this, to which I usually believe them and I agree with that. But for example, I'm married and uh, I'm very attracted to my wife. She's very, very attractive to me. I love her a lot. But I'm also attracted to other women. And I've asked God to take away those attractions. I really have. I've been like, God, well, I, don't, I don't like this. You know, I, don't, I wish I was not attracted. I feel like I was born to be with like 5,000 women, but you know, I, I realize a lot of the women would not they'd be like, you can dream on, but that's how I feel like I was born, but yet my wife, who's Hispanic, has made it very clear, if you did anything close to that, it'd be very dangerous. So, so my point is, regardless of how you, how you think you were born, the message of Jesus is that it doesn't matter how you were born, because we were all born in sin, you must be, and you can be, born all over again if you come into relationship with me. 
And that's, so that's where we're going to stand on homosexuality. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is, is depression seen as a deficiency in your faith? So one of my favorite stories in the Talmud talks about two rabbis who are friends. Um, and one of them became very, fell into a deep depression. And the, the first friend, um, Rabbi Yochanan, turns to him and says, are these sufferings and their reward, are these sufferings wanted by you? And the friend of the depression says, neither they nor their reward. So Rabbi Yochanan reaches out his hand and says, grab my hand and let me help you up. Um, and then later on, Rabbi Yochanan falls into a deep depression and the same friend turns to him and says, are these sufferings wanted? Or, are these sufferings wanted? And Rabbi Yochanan says, neither they nor their reward. And the friend says, take, reaches out his hand and says, take my hand and, and lifts him up. Um, and the text says, why, if Rabbi Yochanan had helped him first, why could he not help himself? And it says that a, a captive cannot free himself. And what I love about this text is that, first of all, it says that if people are suffering from depression, that they cannot help themselves that they need help from outside, even if they've been the person who usually helps other people, that they need to reach out and get help. And the other thing that I, I really like about this text is that it teaches that there, for some people, the idea of uh, the theology of suffering, that there is a reward in suffering, that, there, that that does exist. And some people do find great meaning in their suffering as a, as a test from God, and that's what sort of gets them through it. What it also teaches, the story, is that if you don't want the suffering, if you don't see the suffering as being beneficial, then you have the right to reject it. And there's room for that. Um, and so, and certainly that um, having, suffering from depression does not indicate a lack of faith. Um, it just is. Um, and so I would say that Judaism certainly doesn't see it as a lack, a deficiency of faith, and that it would say that um, one of the, the core teachings of Judaism is pikuach nefesh, the value of saving a life. You can do anything to save a life except for three things. Um, worship idols, kill somebody, not self-defense, but like murder, um, and to engage in, in prohibited sexual activities. And so beyond those three things, anything goes to save a life. And so I can't even stress enough how important it is that if somebody is suffering from depression, the the responsibility that we have to make sure that people are getting help and that it shouldn't be seen that they're um, being punished in some way. <laughs> Hello. How's everyone? No. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, when, when we say in your faith, if I say faith communities, then yes. Um, and this is a problem. Uh, I will come out and say that you know I've struggled. I'm bipolar. I've struggled with this for a long time, uh, even to come to terms with it. I've been suicidal at points in my life, almost attempted suicide. I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of in that. I don't think you should either if you're struggling with it. Uh, and, and sometimes someone needs to come up and say it to say that it's okay to struggle with these things, and no one can do it alone, right? You you need a community to support you, uh, and you need to realize that you know you were created by God, and it, it is the will of the One without beginning and end that you exist. Therefore, your life has a value and a purpose that you may not be able to see immediately in your circumstance when things seem dark all around you. Uh, I went through times in my life where you know, I went through a lot of heartache and suffering and pain, and not that I'm saying I would particularly want to be you know, back in that circumstance again, but out of it I learned something about myself, and one of those things was that I would fight, you know, to fight back. And I was uh, kind of, I, I maybe perhaps unconsciously inherited this uh, perspective that you know, de depression is a sign of deficient faith. And when I finally thought about it seriously, I realized it's kind of a silly argument, right? Because I know people who are terrible Muslims slash human beings, I mean, just bad people, and they don't seem to be particularly depressed, right? They're fine, right? Um, I don't think Saddam Hussein was depressed. Um, I think he was sick and weird. Um, you know, there was a pretty good HBO series about him. But other than that, you know, um, let's not talk about Saddam Hussein. Um, in conclusion, depression is Saddam Hussein. Um, no. um, and, and, uh, oh my God. I also have ADD. That. It's okay, it works occasionally. And, you know, sometimes, 
So, so the first verses of Rumi's Masnavi is great poem. Our Vishnu has nature nikayat mikoned as jidai ha shikayat mikoned. Listen to the neigh, it sings a song, it complains of separation. It means the separation of man from God, right? That as long as we are in exile on earth, we are never whole, right? So there is an extent to which nothing will fix the fundamental isolation of existence because we are alone, right? We, there's, you know, there's 2 p.m. theology where you can come up with like a rational argument for God, and there's 2 a.m. theology when you're alone and you're like, crap, life sucks, like what am I doing, you know? And, and there's a reason, you know, we face that. And, and part of that is the courage of realizing that and accepting that you can never be fully whole in this life, right? Because you're not meant to be here, right? This is not what we were created for. We, we live through this, but we, we're not supposed to end here, right? Um, and, and so I think that, you know, we need to treat depression, we need to talk about these things, but we also need to understand that life is not just about contentment, right? A, a great part of religion is struggle. And, and many of us, if we are honest, we find meaning and purpose not in a placid contentment, but in struggling and striving to become something and contributing to others and giving to others in, in building ourselves, right? It's, it's achievement that gives life purpose and meaning. And, and sometimes we may not be able to see the wisdom of that, uh, but there is wisdom in that. You know, the Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, because you are with me. So we find from the scriptures consistently that men and women of God who were very godly struggled with things like what you might call the dark night of the soul. And what the scriptures seem to say is not that you'll never go through the valley of the shadow of death, but we have a promise from a God who says, when you are in the valley of the shadow of death, I will walk with you. And we find that most fulfilled, anyone that follows Jesus, when he is on the cross, he even asks the question, why? You know, why am I being forsaken? And so when you're watching the embodiment of, of virtue itself, and, and there's nothing, there's no answer. You know, why am I being forsaken? There is no answer at all. But what we find is a promise from a God, and, and by the way, I firmly believe that if by chance in the sovereignty of God there was someone that was here that was depressed tonight, uh, there's a promise that he will be near to the brokenhearted, and Jesus proved that over and over tonight is a large tension between the Jewish and Muslim communities is the crisis in Jerusalem. How can American Muslims and Jews work together to create dialogue on this issue? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking a game of Monopoly. What do you guys think? <laughs> Part of the, the challenge that I see with the, the conversations about um, Jewish and Muslim dialogues in America is that I, I personally, I would love to be proven wrong, but I have never seen these conversations happen in the context of an already existing relationship. Um, and I find that these questions are only asked um, in the context of religious interfaith conversations such as this, um, where there's not a history of trust between individuals. Um, and what strikes me as both interesting and frustrating at the same time is that before engaging in a controversial conversation with anyone about anything that's really challenging, it's considered usually best practice to establish trust and get to know one another. Um, and you know, I wouldn't just like walk up to somebody and say, so tell me about your views on gun control. Or what do you think about abortion, right? Like I would get to know people and have those conversations. It's not that I would never have them, but it would be based on something prior. So um, with Muslim Jewish relationships, though, my experience has been that we try to tackle the really, really hard stuff first um, before trying to establish uh, a relationship and common ground. And there's so many things that Muslims and Jews share in common, so many similar struggles that we have. Um, challenges with the academic calendar and holidays. Um, I can't, I don't even know what it would be like to go through Ramadan during finals. It's bad enough when Yom Kippur is on like the first day of class. Um, <laughs> dietary restrictions, um, how one makes the decision to wear religious garb on a campus where they're a religious minority or not. Pressures to date or even marry somebody at all or especially of the same religious faith um, from their parents. But we don't, that's not where we tend to start. We tend to start with the, ch with the challenges um, in Israel and Palestine. So without ignoring the need to talk about the things that are the most difficult, I think that a better place to start the conversation that would lead to a more productive conversation is to talk about um, values that are underlying these real challenges. What it means to have a homeland. 
what, it, what our traditions teach about having power, and what people's personal connection is to, um, to the land, to Jerusalem, to Israel, to Palestine. Um, but in order for this to happen, then both Jews and Muslims need to be able to take a step back from the rhetoric um, and to engage in personal reflection to be able to answer these questions for themselves, something that I think is rarely done just because people are too busy fighting for what they feel is so close to being lost. And perhaps if we were able to have these values-based conversations, we could move uh, past the fear and begin to hear the real lived human experiences um, and to validate each other's experiences as being that person's truth. And from here, I think we could go on to build relationships and support one another and then move on to have the difficult conversations. If it was an easy conversation, we wouldn't be, the world wouldn't be in the situation that it's in. I don't think there's an easy answer. Uh, so I think uh, echoing that, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of common threats that Muslim and Jewish communities face. For example, in Europe, uh, in France, we were discussing this earlier, uh, you know, it's, it's a crime to deny the Holocaust, uh, and yet you have legislation that forbids the wearing of visible religious garb, which is obviously targeted uh, at Muslim women, you know, and, and to an extent to, to Sikhs and, and to, to Jewish uh, French citizens. And this is happening now in places like the Netherlands and Denmark, where you have the banning of kosher slaughter, which is fundamentally the same as halal slaughter. Uh, it's the same thing, right? So in a lot of ways, there are reciprocities and tensions. And I think even just generally, I've heard now conversations, you know, in, in small circles. Again, you know, I live in New York, which is a pretty um, liberal place, generally speaking. And you hear these conversations about how, well, you know, why does religion get all these exemptions? If, because if we begin as a culture to deny that religion has a specific or unique value, it's not inconceivable for me to see a shift in legislation and understanding of governance where religion is no longer protected in the way it is now. Uh, and that is a little bit frightening because then, you know, rather than the Constitution existing to enable religious practice, you can see interpretations of the Constitution that restrict religious practice. And I think these are conversations that people of faith need to keep in mind. Um, but the reality is, you know, there is a conflict, uh, obviously, uh, in Israel and Palestine, and, and it would be dishonest to pretend like there is not. Uh, the first time I went there, uh, I was 20 years old. Uh, I went as the world's most dangerous and or and stupidest person um, because I was 20 years old, landing on a plane from Cairo where I studied Arabic. I was single, I had no girlfriend, although I said that I tried really hard to rectify that, but it wasn't working out for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I was there to study Arabic, and my roommate was from Saudi Arabia, but he was an Indian citizen, and he also didn't have a girlfriend or anyone who could really miss him when he was gone. Uh, so when we landed in Tel Aviv, Ben they were a little bit like, you're either the dumbest people ever or one of the craziest people ever, but probably both, but anyway. Um, and then I was in Jerusalem. Um, I, I was there again in May and June of, la uh, June of last year, and, and I'm going to be there again in a few months. Um, and, and the reality is, and this is for uh, sort of specifically Muslims in the audience, you know, we tend to describe our religion as a religion of protest, right? We're the religion of Malcolm X, for example, right? And the reality is that the vast majority of the world's Muslims, including the, the biggest population of Muslims in the U.S., African Americans and, and South Asians, are peoples who were recently colonized, right? Who are on the wrong side of modernity. And so religion is, a, is, is inseparable from what we have experienced, right? So who we are shapes what we think religion is. And this is, this is reality. But the American Muslim community is unique among a lot of Muslim communities uh, in that it is very well educated, is wealthy. After the Jewish American community, it is the most gender equal religious community in terms of pay. Uh, it is, you know, remarkably well educated again alongside the Jewish community. Um, and, and what this means is that American Muslims, you know, I think as we get over certain barriers culturally in terms of literature, arts, you know, things like that, we're going to experience an incredible level of power and access, right? Um, my grandmother was illiterate. My father does not know the day he was born. Uh, he was so poor that he wore his pajamas to school. Uh, he studied, he arrived from medical school in Pakistan not knowing English, and the medical school was in English, so he learned English as he learned how to become a doctor. Uh, he is an orthopedic surgeon. My mom is a radiation oncologist. I am at Columbia University. Uh, this story, which is a very American story, is also for many Muslims a very American Muslim story. And what that means is that we now have access to the kinds of, uh, I think, engagement that we may not have had in the past, or our parents or grandparents have not, and we have to develop a moral language to know what to do with power, because it's very easy to talk about right and wrong when, when nothing is on the line, you know? But when your privilege is on the line, that's where you're really tested. And, you know, so for example, I work in national security, and I have in the past in D.C. and in New York, right? 
I see a lot of Muslims who work at State Department, uh, the New York City Police Department, for example, now is about 10% Muslim. The city itself is about 10% Muslim. Some of you are horrified in the audience. Sorry, uh, I was joking. Um, and then we have, like, just, there's too many of us, um, and we don't know how to make shoe racks, which is another problem. Um, nobody understood that at all. And only if you're Muslim can you understand the trauma of the shoe rack. Um, like, where do shoes go? Right? Like, why, why do shoes exist? Um, but what I need to say really is that America's relationship to the Middle East and the Muslim world is going to be a significant part of America's relationship to the rest of the world. One in four people in the world is Muslim. And we may have a special role to play in helping perhaps mediate that relationship or look at it from a better perspective. And we have to ask ourselves on what grounds do we engage civically, politically, for what reasons and to what ends, and are we going to be able to develop a language to challenge ourselves to make sure we're, we're sticking to the right path, so to speak. I don't know that I can speak very well to that one. All I gotta say is we're waiting for Messiah to come, and our, our belief is that when Messiah comes back, oh, this is gonna be shalom. <laughs> To our speakers. Finally tonight, I'd like to introduce our last uh, guest. Uh, he's the president of Islam on campus, uh, Hassan Rashid. Um, wow, that's all I can say. Um, I'd really like to thank, uh, first and foremost, all of our speakers, Rabbi Swedro, Pastor Mike, Harun Mogul, for coming out, giving time um, on you know, it's a Thursday night out of your busy schedule for just coming and addressing all of these wonderful people. And I'd like to thank you guys for all coming out. Um, you made our event very successful. This is our last event of Islam Appreciation Month. I am our Islam Appreciation Month. We hold it every, every February um, to just basically create an appreciation and an understanding for Islam and the Muslims around you, just to show you, you know, we're, we're just like you guys or, you know, have a little bit of understanding of, you know, what, what makes us different, what makes us alike more so than anything else. Um, and lastly, I'd like to really thank our e-board. I'd like to thank um, Jeffrey for helping organize this event as our event head. And I'd also like to thank the IAM committee, um, which were the people that help, helps organize events throughout this entire month. Um, and most of all, I'd like to uh, thank Zara for uh, being the chair for um, this committee. Uh, she worked hard day in and day out just to make this month a success. Um, and I would also like to thank Crew and Haleo uh, for helping co-sponsor this uh, last event. Um, it was clearly successful. And with that, I would like to direct everyone to, to that area over there where there's uh, Subway subs. Majority are vegetarian, there's some turkey, there's some tuna, and there's soda and chips. So please, with that, go and help yourselves, and thank you so much.